Well, give Jesus a great big hand clap. Before you're seated, lift both hands to the Lord. Father, thank you for everyone who's here today. And we thank you that though the enemy stole an hour of our sleep, we'll get it back this afternoon. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Give the Lord another great hand clap. You can be seated. Thank you, musicians. You know, just to say a little word about that offering your uh, pastor brought up. Basically, my secret through the first 40 years of my life and the first 20 years of my ministry would be doing things the wrong way. So Friday night's biggest crowd, that's your chance to take your big offering. You just do the opposite. Give it away. And I did that in January. I told you about that in Hawaii. I took all the offerings for the church there and just took a big loss and a bunch came back. So you just do things to honor God and honor people and almost just take yourself out of the equation. You never hear Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John say, what are we going to eat? It's other people that, that uh, he was looking to feed. Amen? Amen. So uh, it's been an honor, and, and it's worth honoring people that open their church up to have church, particularly now. Amen? Amen. You know, people are wondering whether they can even have Sunday or not. It's, not. it's a rare bird to open their church up, let people come in from all different states, no temperature checks, and, uh, and, and have a great meeting. So I appreciate Pastor Michael and Vicki Hankins. One of my preacher friends called me yesterday and said, how's your meeting going with Pastor Michael? You guys getting along okay? I said, if somebody doesn't get along with Pastor Michael, I think they have a serious problem. You may be demon-possessed. Normally, you need to hear both sides of a story, but if somebody told me they were having a problem with him, I would just know immediately, you have a problem. They're great, great people. Amen. Amen. How, many you, amen. How many are you looking forward to another great week in the presence of God? And I, I pledge 10000 for that offering. It'll be here shortly as soon as my wife finishes selling her plasma. She called me yesterday and told me she's weak. I said, you get down to that blood bank and you honor our pledge. I want you, if you have your Bible, open it with me. Oh, you like that. I want, I want, to, I want you, if you have your Bible, open it with me to Isaiah 53. If you were here Friday, what did I announce we were going to do tonight? Mi miracle service. I was hoping you forgot to get me off the hook, but <laughs> since you remembered, I'm going to take this morning, and I'm not going to pray for anybody this morning, or I'll say this, I'm not intending to pray for anybody this morning, but I'm going to use this morning as an introduction because there's a quick turnaround time from a 10.30 service to a 6 o'clock service to lay a word foundation, and then, and then tonight I'll, I'll minister more out of the word, but pray. And I want to take you on this Sunday morning and just go in. This is from me. I wrote down this morning the five things about miracles and God's miracle power that I feel like people don't understand or that the enemy uses to hinder people from receiving miracles. So I want you to receive this from the Word, and then I'll pray tonight. If you wait after and ask if you can have prayer uh, after the service this morning, I'll just pray that God cleans the wax, wax out of your ears so that you could hear that I said I'm praying for people tonight. Amen. But if you'll hear this, God will help you. Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? I can't stop after every verse, or we'll be here all afternoon. But it's very hard for me not to. To who has believed our message, and to whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? Believing God's message causes his arm to be revealed on your behalf. God is a faith God. T.L. Osborne said, all God ever did was talk, if you read it in the Bible. He didn't form the worlds out of Play-Doh or some substance. He spoke. And God puts big value on believing his word. One other preacher said, God's greatest insult is to be disbelieved, and his greatest pleasure is when a man says, I believe you. So there's a, there's a curse for not believing God. You can read that all through the Bible. In fact, if you don't believe him, you'll end up in hell. But then there's a blessing for believing God. Can you say amen? amen? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence. Of course, this is talking about the Messiah, who is Christ. Like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. 
Yet it was, now every time it says R, I want you to read it my, because if you carry it R, then you're included. Yet it was my weakness he carried. It was my sorrows that weighed him down. So Christ, the term, if you take theology class, is called substitutionary atonement. That Christ took for you, what the devil wanted to lay on you was laid on Christ instead. It was our sorrows that he took. It was, it was uh, my grief that weighed him down. It was my weakness that he carried. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God for his own sins. But he was pierced for my rebellion. He was crushed for my sins. He was beaten that I could have peace. And by his stripes, what does it say in Isaiah? He was whipped so that we could be healed. If you would put it up, in, I know I'm reading out of the New Living, but if you would put it on the King James, because some, sometimes the, the New Living butcher stuff. So by his stripes, say this with me, by his stripes. Uh, uh, you, what does it say in Isaiah? We are healed. So say that with me, by his stripes. We are healed. Now flip over to Matthew chapter 8. I don't know, maybe other people say this too, but in our family we call this the healing chapter of the New Testament, and I'm going to show you why. Matthew 8, verse 1. Large crowds followed Jesus as he came down the mountainside. Suddenly a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him. Lord, the man said, I know if you want to, you can heal me and make me clean. Notice this man wasn't sure. He's like many people, especially in, in a state like Texas or Louisiana that are many God-fearing people. You could find somebody on the street that doesn't attend church, and if you said, do you believe there's a God that can do anything? Most people would say yes. But then the trick is they don't, they don't believe he'll do it for them. Do you believe there's a God that can heal blind eyes? Oh, yeah. Do you believe he'll heal your macular degeneration? Well, you know, I, and that's where the hiccup comes. Because if you believe God has power, that's great. But it'll never do you any good until you realize God wants to do it for you. And so I'm going to get into that a little bit today, Lord willing. And this man is where you see it. Lord, I know if you want to, I know if you're willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Before Jesus healed him, he corrected him. And the Bible says in Acts 10, uh, verse 34, I see very clearly that God is no respecter of persons. What he does for one, he does for all. So when Christ answered the leper, he answered for everybody. I want to. Everybody say, I want to. Be thou made whole or be healed. And instantly. Everybody say, instantly. The leprosy disappeared. Now, I'm gonna, I got my work cut out for me because... Americans love preaching about the process on the way to the product, and sometimes Christians are so obsessed with getting to the destination, they miss the journey. But miracles don't have a journey. Miracles are instant. And maybe I got a little obsessed with that being an evangelist, because, you know, like your pastor, let me stay here two weeks. But usually they kick me out after a day or two, so whatever I was going to do, I needed to get done. I didn't have to tell people, no, listen, we're gonna, I'm, I'm going to keep you. In, I'd have people come up, can you keep me in prayer? I'm not keeping you in prayer. I'm here two nights. Set your faith that we're going to get it done now. And you're going to find that Christ, nobody that came to him desiring something, still needed the same thing after 24 hours. Mi miracles are an instantaneous breaking forth of God's power. Can you say amen? amen. And instantly, the leprosy disappeared. Then Jesus said to him, don't tell anyone about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you've been cleansed. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer came and pleaded with him. Lord, my young servant lies in bed, paralyzed and in terrible pain. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. That's right. The more you read this, you, you wonder, how could anybody ever get tripped up on whether God wants them healed? Find me somewhere in the Bible where someone said, Jesus, I need help. My son needs help. My daughter needs help. My, my servant is sick and needs help. And Jesus, now listen, all you people are ever concerned about is healing, but there's deeper. He never said that. You could pull Jesus out of doing anything. Tell him, he healed people for fun. The Bible tells you you'd be walking around and see a, a woman that's bent in half crippled and touch her, and she'd stand straight up. He, he, he was looking, find me where someone desired something from God, and he said no. Forget healing. 
You won't find anywhere in the Bible where somebody's faith reached out to God for something and he said, no, you know, I know they teach us the opposite in church. I grew up in church and they would teach, uh, sometimes God says yes, sometimes God says, and sometimes God says. Amazing how the devil can get people to memorize something that's not even in the Bible. And I know it too, so I'm not, I'm not taking a shot at you. You could say that in about any church and say, how many know sometimes God says yes and everybody would, sometimes he says no and sometimes he says wait. Where do you find that in the Bible? Where do you find Jesus tell someone, if you wait, I'm going to come back to Capernaum in a year and a half, and I'll heal you then. You don't find it in the Bible. He does not say no. In fact, you could actually find in the Bible where God wanted to do something else. And because people kept praying for something different, he gave them the thing they asked for. One preacher said, when your faith says yes, God will not say no. And that's true. Was it ever God's will to give Israel a king? But, but what did they keep asking for? And what did he give them? A king. Your faith moves God to action. Well, maybe we'll cut it down to one point and go get some lunch and try it again at night. Your faith moves God to action. And you're going to see that in the Bible. And it, that's where people get true. Well, I know in his time, when he's ready, you'll never get anything. It's actually God's ready all the time, and when you become ready, it becomes your time. And basically what the Word does is it knocks all the cobwebs out of you. Well, I, know, you know, I don't know when the Lord's ready. And, and it gets you to realize He's ready now. Now you think of this. If somebody believed in salvation, they believed God could save, they believed Jesus was the only way to heaven, they believed that Jesus did die for them, and they kept saying, I'm waiting for God to save me. In his time, when he's ready, I'm waiting for him to take my sin away and write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And whenever he's ready, I'm ready. When they died, if they never went past that point, where would they go, heaven or hell? Hell, because there has to come a time where you not only you realize that Christ died for you, but that you say, today is the day I'm going to receive salvation. I believe in my heart, I confess it with my mouth, and I receive it, and that becomes the day of salvation. Well, there aren't like different laws for different things. It's the same with healing. There comes a day where you say, no, not only did Jesus take stripes for me, today is the day that I decide I'm going to receive my healing in Jesus' mighty name. And I believe that day will be for you today. If you believe that with me, can you say amen? amen. So he said, uh, I will come. But the officer said, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come in my home. Just speak the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. I know this because I'm under authority and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go or come and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said, this man has way too much faith. People need to dial it back. That's hyper faith. No, Jesus never rebuked anybody for having too much faith, only too little faith. And so the Bible says, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to those following me, he said, I tell you the truth, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come, talking about Texans, from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the feast for, in the kingdom of heaven. But many Israelites, those for whom the kingdom was prepared, will be thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the Roman officer, go back home. What you believed has happened. What does it say in the, in the King James? Oh, the people gave up on me. Go back home. Anybody have a King James? Got to have a King James in Texas. What, say it out loud wherever you're at. It'll be like a, an Alcoholics Anonymous class. Just shout it out. <laughs> then Jesus said to the Roman officer, go back home. Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And the servant was healed that hour. Say that out loud. As I've believed, so shall it be. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. And what does the tongue speak? Jesus said, you don't choose what you say. You choose what you put in your heart, and your heart will determine what you say. Out of the overflow or superabundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the person says, I don't think that'll work. They're absolutely correct as far as they're concerned.
Because God's word doesn't do you any good until you believe it and then speak it. But when you speak it, Jesus said, uh, go thy way as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. Can you say amen? amen? And he was healed that hour. Verse 14, when Jesus arrived at Peter's house, Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever, but when Jesus touched her hand, the fever left her, and she got up and prepared a meal for him. Uh, women are always interesting to me, because when they get healed, they get up and start cleaning or cooking. When I get healed, I basically go back to doing what I was doing when I was struggling, which is just laying down and you know, not doing anything. She got up and prepared a meal for him. That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. Everybody say, many demon-possessed. So this part of the story took place in Portland, Oregon. That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. He cast out the evil spirit with a simple command, and he healed how many that were sick? All that were sick. This fulfilled the word of the Lord that was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took our sicknesses, and he removed our diseases. Hand me your Bible. Give me your Bible. You can't, because why? Because I have it. Jesus took, like I took his Bible, Jesus isn't going to take, I may know one day we'll get to heaven. No, he's not going to take. He took 2,000 years ago on the cross of Jesus Christ all, how many of my sicknesses? And how, how many of my diseases did he remove? All my disease. There's a healing preacher I listen to that has mighty miracles, and he says, I'm as concerned about getting sick as I am about getting pregnant because mo both are impossibilities. He said one's a physical impossibility, and the other is a scriptural impossibility because Jesus didn't say, you know, many people don't believe in healing. Then if they do start believing in it, they just believe, how many know God, when you get sick, God will heal you? I've even heard people say, how many know if you never got sick, you could never know Christ as a healer? No, he didn't say he'll heal you when you get sick. He said he took it, and he said he'll keep sickness and disease out of the midst of you. When I pray tonight, when we minister tonight, even beginning right now, because it's all in one day, uh, I'm believing the last bout with sickness that you ever had. I'm not believing for you to get a touch and have a nice little four-day run of health. I'm believing that the way sickness may have trailed you in your home and with your family, from this day forward, health and healing will overflow your home and your children and your grandchildren to the glory of God and to the shame of the devil. Come on, if you believe that with me, go ahead and put those hands together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say out loud, Jesus is a mighty healer. And, and I'm, I'm saying too much, but uh, you can actually, if you break that eighth chapter down, every sickness and disease there is can be broken into four categories. And Jesus healed all four categories medically in 17 verses. Leprosy, diseases that decay and eat at the physical structure and flesh of the body. Skin decay, organ decay, uh, 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 your, your, your organs start not working right, kidneys start, start failing because they're dying, the flesh of that leper would die. D say with me, diseases of the flesh. Jesus healed that. Then my servant is in terrible pain well, with a palsy. Diseases of the central nervous system. Parkinson's, anything that, that affects your central nervous system, that's what that boy had. Jesus healed that. Number three, Peter's mother-in-law. Sick in bed with a high fever. A doctor will tell you, you can just look on WebMD. Fevers reside in the blood. Number three, everybody say diseases of the blood. Leukemia, sickle cell anemia, HIV, hepatitis B, uh, anything that resides in the blood was in that category. The, sick in bed with a high fever. Of course, some of you older folks know, up until about a handful of decades ago, fever was a very serious thing. Kid, children died of fevers. And so his mother-in-law, that's why, that's why Jesus healed her. She's in bed with high fever. It's serious. Fevers are in the blood. Jesus touched her hand, and the fever left her blood. Category number three. And then category number four, that evening, when evening had, had come, they brought unto him many that were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a simple command. Number four, sicknesses and diseases that are caused by evil spirits. 
thou evil spirit that makes this boy deaf and mute. My, uh, master, there's a spirit that torments my boy and often throws him into the fire water and causes him to have seizures. Illnesses caused by demon spirits. Now, you go get an MRI machine. They never see it. Now, listen, we have something very troubling. We took your MRI. There's like some little gremlin thing uh, attached to you. They don't pick that up. They just pick the results up. But even in 2021, you hear people, I've been to the doctor. I want, they sent me to Johns Hopkins, and they sent the Johns Hopkins sent me up to the Mayo Clinic. They don't know why, why something's wrong with me. There's some people that are tormented with illness, and they'll tell them, oh, we, we can't find anything. I, you know, and half think they're making it up. But one out of every three people, if you list it out on a yellow legal pad and write down every time Jesus delivered someone, one out of three times, roughly, there was an evil spirit that had to be directly dealt with. Thou spirit of infirmity. Thou spirit that makes this boy unable to speak. Was Jesus some dumb, superstitious old timer that didn't understand medicine? No. He's the son of God. So when people came to him and said, my son has a demon, or my daughter's tormented by a demon spirit, Jesus didn't say, <laughs> you hear these people? I know it's the first century, and you, you people think everything's caused by demons, but uh, you'll find out as medical science advances that that's not true. No. He spoke to the spirit and commanded them to leave. Tormenting spirits, spirits of infirmity. So those are the three categories. Diseases of the flesh, diseases of the central nervous system, diseases of the blood, and then diseases that are caused by evil spirits. And in 17 verses, Jesus dominated all four categories. And the Bible says he did this to show that what Isaiah saw in a vision, Christ was the fulfillment of that. Buddha never, I'm not saying this is an anti-Buddhist or an anti-Muslim. I'm saying this, and anybody that was in those religions would back me up. Buddha never healed anybody. Uh, Muhammad never healed anybody. They taught things. They led people into battle. They did other stuff. But Jesus cast out devils and healed the sick to show he was the Messiah that Isaiah foresaw. Can you say amen? John the Baptist doubted his own prophecy and was in jail and sent his followers to say, are you the one or should we look for another? Jesus said, go back and tell your master the things that you see. The blind see, the deaf hear, the cripple walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the poor are having the gospel preached to them. Jesus is the Messiah that Isaiah saw. There's not another. He came. They said, who is this man that even demons obey him? It was a sign of his Messiah. You know, in Islam, they'll tell you about spirits. You don't mess with them. Buddhism, Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you. If you ever hear somebody speak in tongues, run. Don't even deal with them because that's a spirit we don't know how to deal with. No other religion can have dominion in the spirit realm. But Jesus cast out devils. Nobody in the Old Testament cast out devils. David played a harp and it left Saul. That's the closest you get. Elijah never cast out devils. Moses never cast out devils. Elisha never cast out out devils but when Christ came he began to cast out devils by his word and they said a mighty prophet has arisen among us who is this man that even evil spirits obey him when he speaks Jesus operated as a prophet but he's more than a prophet Jesus taught but he's more than a teacher Jesus was the son of God made flesh and he died conquered death rose again never to die again he's seated at the right hand of the father and you can call on him and he will answer you today. Can you say amen? amen? Sorry about that. I was trying to be morning version, but First Peter 224. First Peter 2, 24. He personally, hallelujah, carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his stripes, not ye will be healed, now it's not ye are healed like it was in the other ones because he hadn't got the stripes yet. Because he already took the stripes, by his stripes ye were healed. All you need is a fourth grade English education. 
to know past tense, present tense, and future tense. It doesn't say, I mean, you know, one day we'll get to heaven and all, this, all these physical troubles will be over. No, you can wait till you get to heaven if you want, but you don't have to. It doesn't say he's doing it now. It says he did it 2,000 years ago. That's why when you watch those great evangelistic crusades overseas, when a proper preacher preaches the full gospel, they'll start passing wheelchairs over the heads of the people because not only did he take your sins away in the same redemptive work, what, where did sickness come from? Sickness is not a part of life. Sickness, John Alexander Dowie said, sickness is the foul offspring of its father Satan and its mother sin. Was there any children's hospitals in the Garden of Eden? Was there any Walmart prescription center in the New Jerusalem? No. Are there any handicapped parking spaces in heaven right now? No. Sickness came with sin. Sickness is the foul offspring of its father Satan and its mother sin. And so when Jesus came, 1 John 3, 8, he didn't just come to start a religion or teach things. For this reason was the Son of God made manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Is sickness a work of the devil? Yes, it is. That's why every time Jesus saw it, he attacked it like an enemy. He saw a man in John chapter 5 that had been crippled for 38 years when Jesus saw him he went over to him and said sir would you like to get better I can't I don't have anybody to help me you can't blame the guy 3.8 decades of sitting there crippled nobody will help you when you go through something for a long time you get discouraged it's a natural part the devil comes along with the sickness and says God forgot about you if he was going to help you he'd help you now I don't have anybody to help me. Jesus said, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. And immediately, the man jumped to his feet, took up his bed, and started walking. When he saw sickness, he attacked it because sickness is not in the plan of his father God. Sickness is an attack on mankind from Satan. But Jesus destroyed it then, and you can use his name and destroy it now. In fact, I'm going to add a sixth thing in. So let me, let me finish this one. Point number one, say this out loud. Healing, Healing. Comes, with comes with salvation. That's right. It's not a separate thing. The same blood that purchased my dominion over sin purchased my dominion, not just healing, my dominion over sickness and disease. He didn't just say it heal you. He said, if you believe in me, you'll lay your hands on the sick and they'll recover. There'll be so much healing for you, it'll come out of you and heal where you go. And see, if you don't understand that, you'll either be strong on both or weak on both. That's why they don't preach healing. They don't preach victory over sin anymore because they don't understand the blood and the atonement. I mean, no, we sin every day. I mean, no, as long as we're in these human bodies, we'll all make mistakes. That is, a, that is the opposite of what the Bible says. Because he took, put uh, 1 Peter 2.24 up in the King James again. He took, he carried away my sin. I don't have to sin. I've been delivered from sin. I don't have to be an addict. That came from the devil. He took my sin and he took my sickness. I can live to please God in my spirit and I can live healthy in my body because of what Jesus has done. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being what to sin? I mean, we all sin it. How can you be dead to something and do it? Say dead to sin. Preacher, I need a lot of prayer. No, you need to read and believe. Or you'll be coming up to the altar, hunched over for the same thing. I just battle alcohol. I just battle anger. No, quit battling it. Jesus took it from you, and you can instead lift your hands and say, thank you, Jesus, that 2,000 years ago, I've been delivered from heroin. I've been delivered from depression. I've been delivered from thoughts of suicide because you took it in your body on the tree. Shout out, my sins are gone. Hallelujah. 
Same devil that tells people they'll always be an addict tells them they'll always be a cripple. It's the devil that tells you that won't work. But who cares what the devil says? When you believe God's word in your heart, lift up your hands and speak it with your mouth. The last day the devil intruded in your life will be the last day he ever does. Because he has no answer for the word. Jesus quoted one scripture to the devil. Change the subject. Quote a second scripture. Change the subject again. Quote a third scripture and he left. Would not argue with what is written. My Uncle Ted that I've played his videos got a big tumor on his neck. And it broke open and had like bloody pus running down it. And he was at a minister's conference as a healing preacher. And he got, he, he got a revelation on that scripture when he wanted to get healed from it. You know, Pastor Hankins and I were talking last night. You know, we couldn't afford to go to the doctor. My father made $4,200 gross income his first year in full-time ministry with me. That's not 1920. That's 1980. We got to say there's, there was no option. We couldn't afford to go to a clinic. Anoint with oil. Old-time, full gospel people didn't believe in divine healing. They practiced divine healing. It wasn't prayer for someone as the ambulance came to get them. It was, it was son, lift your hands and, I, and lay hands on and pray. Father, you promised you'd heal our families in the book of Exodus. If we'd forsake the gods of this world, you said no sickness or disease will, will come near our dwelling. I curse this sickness in my son's body in Jesus' name. Every time he finished praying, I didn't feel any better. And he would say, now go up and go to sleep. And when you wake up, it'll be gone. I remember the last time it happened. I woke up in a pool of sweat, fever broken. And, well, you don't know how the story ends. And my dead are alive. Because God's word is not a joke. God's word never fails. God is too faithful to fail. Can you say amen? amen? I wrote this book. Two th- I'm not doing this to sell, well, I am kind of doing it to sell books. I didn't write it so people want to get them. But I'm bringing it up because at the end of 2019, before there was any talk of COVID, I felt the Lord speak to me about people don't know healing anymore. There's no talk about it in full gospel church. And so put it, put it where people can read it. And I wrote a short one. T.L. Osborne said a book should be able to fit in a man's back pocket or he won't read it. So I put 50 pages, broken into three sections, to know healing, to know that it's part of what you have. Then that disease came out. I'm going to tell you right now, if COVID would have hit in 1980, they would have had COVID healing services. Kenneth Hagin would have put, would have packed an auditorium and had them bring people in on ventilators and pray for them. But the weakening of the word of God and the knowledge of his word allowed a spirit of fear to come in and give life to that thing. But just like a spirit of fear comes in from a lack of knowing God's word, you can sow the word and drive that sucker back out. Now is the time to let the body of Christ be filled with great faith. Say out loud, I don't have fear. I have faith. That's right. And faith drives out fear on its own. Faith will make you laugh in the face of adversity. Can you say amen? Amen. Because you're confident of what God did. So my uncle's at that meeting. He took, everybody say he took all my sicknesses. So if Jesus took it, it's his, it's not yours. Can you pray for my arthritis? Can't take something away from you that's yours, that's stealing. You pray for my diabetes. It'll always be yours if you claim it. So (laughs) these preachers are saying to my uncle, what's that on your neck? He said, that's Jesus' tumor. They looked at him weird. Well, Jesus must have not liked people, him going around telling people that's Jesus' tumor because it was gone in about 48 hours. (laughs) It ain't mine. Everybody say, it ain't mine. mine. Just because hell sends sends you a package doesn't mean you have to sign for it and bring it in the house. 
You can tell that Amazon guy to put it back in the truck and head on down the road. And the devil may have sent many packages to your home and family, but they're getting marked return to sender today and tonight in Jesus' name. If you believe that with me, celebrate it ahead of time. Take 30 good seconds. Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Say, he took it. Say, I don't have to have it. So I'm not. You know, I'm not, I, I'm doing this to make a point. I don't have any, any negative feelings about the Assemblies of God. I have an Assemblies of God background. But one of their 16 fundamental truths, actually it's one of their four cardinal doctrines, is divine healing. And if you go on their website, the first part was written by a man named P.C. Nelson, who, was, who ministered around here. And uh, I think he was Danish, and he had a Hebrew Old Testament Aramaic Gospels and Greek New Testament and just read it himself. If you read his books, it'll say underneath um, author's translation. He just did it himself. I think he, I think he, he was, uh, he, spoke, he, sp he spoke and wrote like 30, over 30 languages. He was in the military before he did, did Bible stuff. So he wrote the first part. And this is where you see the divide come. But the Assemblies of God had written in the 50s. That healing is the children's bread and is the privilege of every believer. You have a right to be healed. And then underneath that it says amended year 2000. I don't know who the guy is that wrote the amendment, but somebody should slap the taste out of his mouth. And I'd be happy to do it. So if you see a theologian walking around Texas with a red handprint on their mouth, you say, did you meet Evangelist Jonathan? Because <laughs> they were amended year 2000. First of all, the, the nerve to amend... Until you've done twice what he did, keep your mouth shut. That guy didn't just write about healing. That guy had sick people brought to him. Remember when they were saying, because Dr. Fauci messed it up, Dr. Fauci said he accidentally confused the case fatality rate with the infection fatality rate, which is a big deal. Because case fatality means 2% of everyone that goes to the hospital with COVID is going to die. But he said the infection fatality rate, which means everyone that gets COVID, he said 2% of people would die, which is why the... The country flipped out. So he said it was an accident. It's interesting that if it was a mistake, he took a year to correct himself. But you remember when the thing first came out, everybody was comparing it to the Spanish flu, which did have about a 2% kill rate. The average person that died of COVID was 78 or older. The Spanish flu was taking out children and teenagers, which is worse because they have a statistic called life years lost. Obviously, it's sad when anyone dies. But it's much sadder when an 8-year-old dies than when a 91-year-old dies. Because the 91-year-old's been married and, and, and lived. They lived their life. The Spanish flu's knocking everybody out. Catherine, uh, not Catherine Coleman, Amy Simple McPherson. There was a national lockdown on any kind of gathering. And Amy Simple McPherson petitioned the government in Tulsa, Oklahoma to allow her to have an auditorium for three weeks and allow people together, if, if, if they want. If you find it on Google, you can pull the picture up. And they brought people in in sheets with Spanish flu, 2% kill rate, dropping everybody, healthy people, unhealthy people. You didn't need comorbidities or anything. You got that thing, you were in trouble. And for three weeks, they brought people on stretchers and sheets, and she preached, maskless. And everybody's wearing masks then, mandated. Preach to them. She wasn't, now listen, I'm going to preach. I'm going to stay up here because I was, no. She realized that as a believer, not as an evangelist, as a believer, God has not only given me his word to give people, but he commanded. He didn't say if you get around to it. He said everywhere you go and preach, heal their sick. Cast out devils. Raise the dead. Cleanse the lepers. Freely you've, you've received, freely give. And she preached for three weeks. Then would lay her hands on the people on the sheets. And they got, now look at Tulsa now. Because you can actually leave a deposit in a place. She drove the devil's back end out of that place. You know, uh, uh, your pastor worked with a man named Dr. Oral Roberts. 
Dr. Oral Roberts, they would have a deliverance and healing room separate from the auditorium because so many people were being healed, they would bring people that were like in bad shape that couldn't sit in a service. So they'd have them lay in a hospital bed or whatever in a side room, and that's where Kenneth Copeland got his start. Because what he would have Kenneth Copeland do is take notes on what he preached, then go into that side room with the sick people and fill them in on what he preached. And then he would come in and just pray for them. And one day he said, I'm too tired to go in and pray, so I need you to not only tell them what I preached, but pray for them. That's how he got his start. Minister to the sick. That's not a nicety. That's a command. That's part of the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Those that believe and are baptized will be saved. Those that refuse to believe will be damned. And these signs, these signs will follow everyone. How many people will they follow? That's why God can't hardly, you, you know, you have people who don't believe in it. And then because so few people believe in it, somebody believes in it and the Lord starts using them and they get raised up in pride. I have a healing ministry. Big deal. It's supposed to, I was telling Pastor Hankins last night, I think one of the best things about having a ministry family is you can't ever get pride because your family doesn't think you're special. (laughs) Hey, we had two blind people healed healed in our meeting last night. That's great. Pass the potatoes. No, nobody thinks you're special. But then people now, you know, they get, they get one person healed with the sniffles, and all of a sudden they got business cards and a six-button red suit starting a church somewhere. I'm an apostle. Now listen, just because you have some ice cream in your freezer doesn't make you bluebell. Amen. Yeah, because the Bible doesn't say these signs will follow special people. It, says, it doesn't say it will follow apostles or prophets or evangelists. It says these signs will follow all. All who what? Everybody say, I believe. Say, I believe Jesus died on the cross, broke the curse, conquered death, and rose for me. When you believe that, these signs will follow them that believe. They will lay their hands on the sick. And not the sick might recover. Not sometimes God will say yes. Sometimes God will say no. Sometimes God will say wait. They will lay their hands on the sick and the sick shall, will definitely recover. And I'm telling you this morning, you have scriptural grounds to kiss sickness goodbye. It might have run in your family for five generations, but it dies with you. You're leaving this Sunday the healed of God in Jesus' mighty name. Go ahead and celebrate ahead of time. Clap your hands, all ye people. Hallelujah. Healing is included in salvation. Turn to Exodus 15. I'm just going to do two points because I, I can't. Exodus 15. I used to hear people, and a lot of you grew up in full gospel church. I used to hear people all the time. I believe in the last days sicknesses will come because Jesus prophesied. One of the signs before he returned, this is why this this church didn't shut down and isn't shut down now. This is why we didn't shut down. Because Jesus said, before I return, one of the signs will be that there will be plagues, plural, If it said a plague, then I'll sit this one out. But since he said it's going to be par for the course, that they're going to keep coming, let me tell you something. Now that the global hierarchy found a way to shut nations down and do what they want through disease, you think this will be the last one that pops out? And I'll tell you, there'll be ones that are more severe than COVID. So what are you going to do? Weld yourself in your house till it's over? Or claim the word, do do, do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness. Though a thousand fall at your one side and ten thousand fall at your right hand. These evils shall not touch you. Not, Not they'll touch you and you'll get healed. They shall not touch you. Say this out loud. I mean, let's just say some stuff that messes the devil up. Say this out loud. What kills others dies in my hand. That's right. You would do well, you know, because you need to not only know the word, the Bible actually commands you 
to be followers of them who by faith and patience have obtained the promise of God. Why do you think I rattle off these stories about these old preachers? Because when I would preach for guys that were older, that I'd finish and they'd say, well, I used to believe like that when I was your age too, but then, you know, I had uh, my wife got this, and now I don't believe that anymore. Let me just get, tell you something that I was telling my nephew on the way over. Never rewrite your theology in the middle of a storm. Because actually the devil's main plan when you're going through a difficult time is to say, well, you, like Job's wife. Yeah. Serve God all that time. Look at yourself. <laughs> Are you still going to hold on to what he said? Why not just curse God and die? Yeah. Job, who seemed like a very nice man, if, if you read it, he was super patient with everybody. He said, you talk like a foolish woman. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him, which was not him giving permission to God. To, he's just saying, like Kenneth Hagin said. He said, I'd rather die than say God's word isn't true. God's word is true. It's not a book of nice sayings to help you get through the week. It's living power. So when, when the enemy brings difficulty, the main thing he's trying to get you to do is say, well, I used to believe in that stuff, you know, and then... You know, you, let's say you hit a turbulent time in your business. Everybody, everybody can shout about prosperity when they've got plenty of money in the bank. Then what happens if the enemy brings an attack against your business? Well, the main thing the enemy wants to do, well, I used to believe that prosperity stuff, but now this has happened. And I re no, that's actually the time to, like, dig your heels into it. I believe your word. And that's what I started to say about that Assemblies of God doctrine thing. Because they start talking against, in the thing, positive confession. They said, nowhere in the Bible does it tell you to confess something that isn't true. Well, number one, when you confess God's word, you're never confessing something that isn't true. Let every man be a liar. God's word is true. Secondly, God never told you to say something. God never told people to declare something that they actually didn't have. Oh, yeah? So, hey, genius, what do you think it meant when it said, let the weak say, I am? He didn't say, let the weak wait till they're strengthened and say, I'm strong. Any dummy can say what they see. That's what most people do. Hot out today. Humid. Sunny. Cloudy. Well, you're a, you, what revelation you carry? Anybody can say what they see, but it takes, it takes the unction of God on the inside of you to declare what God's word says in the midst of the storm. And I'm going to tell you, if you refuse to back off of God's word, it makes the storm back off. Let God be true. Let every man be a liar. Even every defeated person's favorite Bible character, Job. Well, what about, yeah, I, know I heard him preach that on Sunday morning. What about Job? What about Job? Well, God made him sick. Is that, no? It says in Job 2, 7, then Satan went forth from the presence of God and smote Job with boils. It was the devil that took from Job and made him sick. Number two, Job lived two covenants before us, and every covenant improved on the one before it. Job was under a majorly inferior covenant to the one that we have. He wasn't even under the Levitical covenant. He was under like a Windows 95 covenant. He, he had a Motorola flip phone covenant. He had an America Online covenant. And he said so. He said, oh, oh that I have had an advocate to take my case before the Father. Oh, that I had someone to be an intermediate between me and God, but I don't. Yet though I've never seen him, I know my Redeemer lives and will stand upon the earth one day. Talking about Christ. Job didn't have Jesus. Job couldn't rebuke sickness in the name of Jesus. Job couldn't claim the blood of Jesus. Job was left out with no word and no Christ. But even under that covenant, Bible scholars say the whole book took 18 months. And in Job 42.10, then God restored to Job double. Everybody say double. Everything that he lost, and he lived another 140 years. Job doesn't end with him with boils and sickness. It ends with him rich and healed. And I'm going to tell you, your book's not going to end with you poor and sick. Your job's going to end with you in abundance and healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Go ahead and clap for the Lord one more time if you believe it.
Say one more time, he took. Now, I want you to close both eyes and lift your right hand to the Lord and say this. If he took it, I don't have to take it. Say this out loud. It's illegal for the devil to lay on me what's already been laid on Christ. And I want you to keep your eyes closed. T.L. Osborne used to tell people, picture Jesus on the cross carrying in his body what the devil's trying to put in your body right now. You don't have to double pay for groceries. If I paid for your groceries, the manager would say, oh, I know he paid for them, but they're your groceries and you have to pay again. If the price is paid, it's no longer owed. Jesus took, not will take, not is taking. Well, I may mean, know one day in heaven all our sicknesses. No, he took. So you actually don't even have to pray about it. God, I just ask you to heal me. God's up in heaven going, why don't you read Isaiah 53? You read his word. The entrance of his word gives light. By his stripes, I am healed. Can you say amen? amen. And I'm going to skip all the rest except the last one. So that was number one, healing is included in salvation. And number five, I count different. God is ready to help you right now. That's what I ended this book with because I think that's one of the things, might be the thing that keeps people the most in bondage. They believe God will do it. But like I told you, if you believe God's, God will save you someday, you'll go to hell. You have to get saved. If you believe God will heal you someday, you'll likely uh, stay sick and die. Because you have to believe what he did 2,000 years ago. I can take right now. Say this out loud. Healing is the children's bread. That means daily necessary provision. No parent, no matter how wicked they are, punishes their child with food. You were bad, no eating for two days. Even an evil parent doesn't take food away from their children. And healing is the daily. There's actually, just like your body will decay naturally every day if it's not taken care of. God has daily bread. And think of this. That woman in Matthew 15 said, uh, uh, even the crumbs that fall from the table, the dogs get. One crumb of that bread healed her daughter. And you get the whole loaf. Can you say amen? amen? Now, do you see as much, and I'm going to pray for people tonight, but full gospel people have great value on prayer, mostly, and, and little value on the word. I heard you're going to preach. When, when are you going to pray for people? Why don't, if you listen. See, just the, these 40-some minutes make it where you're like, you know what? I don't see any reason why I have to stay sick. That's why when Paul preached in Acts 14, the Bible says Paul noticed the man and realized he had faith to be healed. And called to him in a loud voice. He said, now I'm going to pray for you. Father, help him to what? Stand up. Because he received it from the word. How many of you can tell that the Lord's touching your body even right now as you're listening? Because God's word is a healing balm. Six Bible reasons why you can be healed immediately. Number one, understand immediately. The word immediately is used 55 times in the Bible. All of which are in the New Testament. Most surround the miracle healing and deliverance ministry of Jesus and the apostles. Number two, Jesus feels what you feel. Jesus put on a flesh body. He lived in that human body. He knows what it's like to go through what you go through. And he took on whatever you're battling, took it to the cross with him and conquered it. Number three, Jesus has compassion for you. Say that out loud, Jesus is compassionate. Jesus has more compassion for you than you have for you. But after all I did, I don't deserve it. Jesus isn't up in heaven saying, after all you did, you don't deserve it. Well, I did it to myself. Jesus doesn't care. If Jesus only helped people that didn't do things to themselves, everybody would go to hell. Everybody did their own sinning. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God's a God of mercy and compassion. Can you say amen? amen. Isaiah 49, 14. 
Yet Jerusalem says the Lord has deserted us. The Lord has forgotten us. Have you ever felt that way? Anytime the devil tries to attack with sickness and disease, self-doubt often follows. It's Satan's two-pronged attack. He not only wants you to be sick, he wants you to think you did something to tick God off or he's forgotten about you or he's mad at you. But here's God's response in Isaiah 49, 14, and 15. Because Jerusalem said, the Lord has deserted us and the Lord has forgotten us. So here, here's what God's response was when people say that. Never. It was say never. Can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child she has born? But even if that were possible, I will never forget you. See, I have written your names, hallelujah, on the palms of my hands. Jesus doesn't just feel what you feel. He has compassion about what you're going through. Understand that Jesus loves you. Everybody say, Jesus loves me. I think it's John 17, 23. Jesus said, I thank you, Father, that you love my disciples as much as you love me. Why don't you say that? It'll knock any religion you have rattling in your bones out of you. Say, I thank you, Father, that you love me as much as you love Jesus. Now, when you understand that, that's why the Bible says faith worketh in love. Because when I, me knowing that God loves me that much gives me great confidence to ask what I want and receive it. Amen. I was sitting in the DMV about a year ago this time. And it was taking an eternity to get my driver's license renewed. The place was packed. That's why there's people worried about mandatory vaccination. Let me tell you, if the same people in charge of the DMV are in charge of mandatory vaccines, don't worry about it. <laughs> They'll never get around to you. I'm sitting there. And uh, I had to cancel one appointment. Been there like two hours at this point, now two and a half. And then, then I, got, I had enough. And I just said out loud, which I wasn't trying to make a scene or anything, but I, I was irritated. I said, Father, get me out of here in Jesus' name. You know, I'm from the Northeast. We get right to the point. I know God has a lot going on. So I just, Father, get me out of here in Jesus' name. You know, anytime you go to step out in faith, there'll always be somebody full of unbelief. Be your aunt, your own mother. Somebody will always feel like they need to... to Pull you back. This lady that was sitting next to me hadn't said anything to me for over an hour. I let that go out of my mouth. They all got the same voice. You really think that God cares whether you get out of here or not? And I said back to her what I'm trying to brand into your spirit. I said, oh, yeah, I'm actually his favorite. Somebody say, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. You think if, if you grew up, if you had the privilege to grow up in church, you think how they'd have you sing that little song and how, what an anointing is still on. My dad leads it in his meetings, plays guitar and sings it. Jesus loves me. This I know. Say it all out, Jesus loves me. Jesus. Now, you, you can't know that and say, well, I don't know, you know, and then I've done a lot. No, he loves me. He loves me. And because he loves me, I can ask what I will, and he'll give it to me. And the only motivation I need, I just said, oh, Lord, get me out of this DMV, because if you do, I'll go win souls. Yeah, I will win souls. But he does what he does for me because he loves me. Yeah. And again, I'm not going to argue with people, because I, 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 let me just say it, and don't take it wrong. So, how many know God blesses us so we can be a blessing? No, he'll bless me, and I will be a blessing. But the number one reason he blesses me it's because he loves me. He loves me. I don't feed my daughter because one day I know she'll grow up strong and might help me out in the ministry. I feed her because I love her. I, give, I bless her because I love her. I take her to Disney World, which I hate with a passion. It's like a concentration camp with rides. But I take her because she likes it and I love her. You know, you're getting old when you get as excited as you used to get to go on a roller coaster. You get that excited when you see an empty bench. <laughs> there, there was an empty bench at Disney World, and I saw it, and I saw this lady that was in her late 60s saw it at the same time. 
She had a cane. I thought, I don't care. <laughs> Pretended not to see. Because I love my kid. And I'm not God's, I didn't join God's religion. I'm God's very own child, and I've been born into his family by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. You're God's son. You're God's daughter. He loves you. Anybody ever have their kid sick and you thought, I wish I was the one that had it instead of them? You know, God thought the same thing, but he actually had the power to make it happen. So he put his son on the cross, and the sickness that was supposed to kill me went in Jesus instead, and now I can live a long time. I'm going to preach. If Jesus tarries, I'll be like Brother Roberts, preaching at 92 years old with ears the size of satellite dishes, telling people that Jesus loves them. Because whatever sickness was meant to take me out, Oral Roberts and everybody else, Jesus took it in their place. I'm going to tell you right now, whatever you're struggling with, Jesus took it in your place. You're only one prayer away from a miracle. You can call on him now, and he'll answer you and deliver you out of all your trouble. Say out loud, my father loves me. See, when you know your dad loves you, you're different. My daughter, the first time my wife ever left me alone with my daughter because I was pretty much useless as a parent. She was two and a half, and the doll said, I need to run out. Can you just watch her, you know? Just just do, don't let her die. She had a very low bar for me. Please make sure she's breathing when I return. So Camila's walking around the house in a diaper, and that's it. And uh, my kid, from the time Adalys was pregnant with her, we had no staff or anything. So Adalys would run the camera for her live streams. It, you know, eight months pregnant. I got pictures of her eight months pregnant in foreign, you know, she's Puerto Rican, foreign stiletto heels. I think she went to the delivery room in heels and hoop earrings. Doing the camera, big belly, four-inch heels. So Camila heard preaching in the womb. Then, until she started uh, kindergarten, they traveled with me every meeting. I, I preached on the road all the time back then. And I would do noon service and seven service. So Camila you know, just heard preaching all the time. I see her with her stuffed animals lined up preaching to them. Remember one time she prayed for all of them, then put a blanket over all their legs, <laughs> and then said in her karaoke microphone, she was three, Be back tomorrow at (laughs) 7. So, you know, when all you hear is preaching, you're different. So Camila comes down the stairs, puts her hand on the hip of her diaper and goes, Hey, Pa. I said, Yeah. She went, Get me a yogurt in Jesus' name. I said, Camila, I'm your dad. I'm not a demon. You can just say, please. But I did notice, I did go to the refrigerator and get her a yogurt. God said, command ye me concerning the works of my hand. I love him. He loves me. He said, there's nothing he won't withhold from me. So I'm not giving some kind of beggar prayer. Oh, God, I don't know. I know. I don't know. Father, I thank you that you already sent your son to do all the work. You said you won't withhold anything from me. You said the only motivation you need to give me something is so my joy will be full. Does sickness bring you joy? It sure doesn't. Is it in the plan of God for you to be sick? How many people in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did Jesus tell to stay sick? How many? How many did he tell your sickness was sent from God so you could learn to have stronger faith? How many? How many did he tell your sickness is for a higher reason? Not one. I was going to say, I don't know where people get that theology, but I do. The bowels of hell. Pull it out of Satan's rear end. That's where it comes from. It's actually lower than that. What kind of person? Tell me what person Jesus ever gave a lecture to about the benefits of them staying sick. You know, my sickness is just what, that's my cross to bear. Your cross to bear is your personal sacrifice for the advancement of God's kingdom. But anything Jesus redeemed you from, the devil does not have any right to lay on you what's already been laid on Christ Jesus. 
When Jesus died and he broke the curse of the law, Galatians 3, 13 and 14, is poverty listed as a blessing in Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 14, or is it listed as a curse in 15 to 68? Curse. So if Jesus took poverty, I don't ever have to be poor. And actually, he'll give me, he won't just meet my needs. I mean, God will meet the need. No, he won't. He'll give you an overflowing cup that your joy will be full. The first time I ever chartered a jet was when Camila was born. And she was laying in bed next to me, and I had to go preach. She'd only been out of the womb a few days. I'd barely seen her, and I had to go up to Boston to preach. 11-hour drive, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to see if there's an afternoon flight out to Boston so I can stay home and just be with her a couple more hours. But there wasn't. There was one at 2 p.m., and because of the 9-11 rules, you can't book a flight a few hours out because they've got to scan you and all that. So then I thought, well, what about chartering a plane? Because if I did that, I could stay home the whole of Saturday and be with my wife and kid. That's the whole reason. It's not so I could win souls, so I could be with my wife and daughter. See, family's important. If I lose my wife, it's going to hurt my ministry. But God actually likes for you to take time. It's like Friday night, not to keep talking about that offering. It's, it's good for a preacher and his wife to just be able to go and enjoy life together. Yeah. Actually, they'll get the best out of them. Because the religion always wants you to sacrifice them for the cause of the kingdom, but God will actually do both things. You lay down your life to advance the kingdom, but then God will also do things where you can enjoy time with your family. Yeah. Well, I didn't know that back then, though. So I just thought, well, I'll call and see about chartering a plane. Well, did you know, to cut a long story short, the guy that we called that owned the jet chartering company, I didn't tell him I was a preacher. You know how the world feels about a preacher using a jet. I have an aneurysm. Preacher using a jet. I just, I just said, hey, my, my wife just had a baby, and if you'll help me out getting a plane, never had done it before. I didn't even fly first class back then. Couldn't afford the $1,100 ticket. I had just enough to charter a plane. I thought, you know what? I want to spend time with my wife and daughter so bad today. I'm willing to clean myself out and start from scratch tomorrow. I want to be with them. And so I told that guy, if you can help me, I just had a baby, and I'd love to spend more time with my wife and daughter. Little did I know that God had, must, the Holy Ghost must have had me say that. He emails us back. And says, I want you to know that I grew up in an Assemblies of God church. We used to have two evangelists come to our church every year, one in the spring, one in the fall. He said, I always noticed they had beat up cars, and they always seemed tired. And he said, even as a kid, I felt bad that their families weren't with them. So I said, when the Lord gave me this company, he just took it over a few weeks ago. Father, if you know any young evangelist that I can help out with, with a plane, so that they can spend more time with their family. Show me who they are, and I believe you're the one that he's showing me. Now, I want to show you something that, that I've thought of since then. God didn't tell him, call Jonathan. God, that offer was available for the first person that had faith to make the phone call. And I'm going to tell you, when he said, I believe you're the answer to that prayer, and I'm going to give you the price that a pilot pays. I called him up, and I said, thank you. But don't believe I'm the answer to that prayer. I am the answer to that prayer. And if you have a Teddy Shuttlesworth call or any other Shuttlesworth call, they're imposters sent from the enemy to steal my blessing. That one belongs to me. And instead of, instead of driving 12 hours like I was going to from Pittsburgh to Boston, instead I spent the whole day with my wife and daughter. Got up in the morning, the same time I would get up to go to my church in Pittsburgh, got on, went to go on the plane. I said, what time are we taking off? They said, whenever you're ready, Mr. Shutt Mr. Shuttlesworth. <laughs> Only time I'd ever been called Mr. Shuttlesworth as if, as if it was followed by, we're going to have to ask you to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody feeling you up to see if you have Al-Qaeda hidden in your trousers. <laughs> get right on the plane. 
Landed at an airport 10 minutes from the church. The pastor was there with a Dunkin' Donuts coffee waiting to pick me up. I want to tell you, I felt like preaching that day. I felt like Elijah and Oral Roberts and Jesus wrapped into one because it was good. I realized you don't have to have it hard. I could have come up and said, I, I, I had a 12-hour drive and bear with me this morning. No, but you can actually with your faith realize that God loves you. He doesn't have planes for pornographers and casino owners and then you can't. No, God has the best that you might have life and have it more abundantly the same way the same way it works in the realm of money it works in the realm of your health God wants you strong so you can be happy there's no joy in sickness sickness is awful sickness the moment you get it you start thinking about how you can get rid of it because it's not in the plan of God for man it came with the devil but Jesus broke his power you're not with the devil you're with Christ and everything that belongs to Christ belongs to you and every Everything that came with the devil has to vacate your life now. Stand on your feet, everybody, and as you do, give Jesus the biggest, biggest hand clap you've ever given anybody. Come on, give him, give him the highest praise. Come on, give him the highest praise. Say it out loud. I refuse to be in sin. Say, Jesus gave me righteousness. Say, I refuse to be broke. Jesus gave me an overflowing cup. And say this, I refuse to be sick. Jesus gave me health. Now lift your hands and begin to thank God out of your mouth that today marks an end to every assault against your body. Oh, you sound good. I don't hear people pray like that that much. I'm not having diabetes. Jesus took it. I'm not having heart disease. Jesus took it. I'm not having kidney failure. Jesus took it. It was supposed to take him four days to die. He died in a few hours because he took my sickness. He took your sickness. It was laid on him. I'm not having lung disease. And then if you had an attack against your body and there's some lingering effect from it, he took that too, so be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Let me see if I have the scripture right off the top of my head. Put Proverbs 3.23 on the board in the King James. Might be the wrong one, but it might not be. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 23. 24. I want to go with Pastor Vicki. She said, I think it's 24. Let me get it. I got it here. Proverbs 3, uh, 27 and 28 in the King James. I was off by four verses. Which, which matters? Withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. Verse 28. Say not unto thy neighbor, go and come again, and tomorrow I will give thee when thou hast it by thee to give now. Is God a hypocrite? Would he tell you when it's in your power to help someone today, don't tell him to come back tomorrow, and then tell you to come back tomorrow when it's in his power to help you today? That scripture helped me that I never have to wait till tomorrow to receive anything from God. It's in his power to do it right now, and he won't tell me. And can you back it up from scripture? Sure you can. Jesus never told the leper, if you come back tomorrow, tomorrow's leper night. He helped them all right now. Actually, that's why when it was in his power to do it, uh, sir, my uh, Jairus, I'm Jairus, my daughter is sick at the point of death. Will you come? No, maybe uh, today's pretty busy. He came right then. Can you say amen? And there you have the scripture. Let me see 327 again. I like that. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it's in the power of your hand to do it. Don't say to your neighbor, come back tomorrow when it's in your power to help them today. That's how God thinks. So now somebody tell me one scriptural reason why you have to walk out of here sick right now. I don't see it. This is a legal document. God doesn't run on emotions. 
runs on his word. You can't make any case from God's word while you have to leave this, this building sick. It's unscriptural and it's illegal. Yeah, but I had this a long time. Still, still illegal. You could be doing something for a long time, it's illegal. If they catch you, it still gets seized. And that illegal sickness in your body is getting seized by heaven's FBI right now. <laughs> Lift both hands to the Lord. Father, I thank you. I see a crimson stream of blood that flows from Calvary. It's waves that reach the throne of God flow over every one of your sons and daughters right now. I thank you for new kidneys. I thank you for new hearts. I don't mean a spiritual heart. I'm talking about that five ventricle ticker in your chest. I thank you for new eyes. I thank you for macular degeneration being washed out of eyes. In Jesus' name. I thank you for hearing ears. I thank you for the reversal of everything that doctors counted as part of old age. I thank you your promises don't run out as we get older. They're as strong at 81 as they are when we're one. We receive your power into our bodies right now. Now you say it out loud. Say, thank you, Father, that your word is true, that Jesus did it for me. I receive it now. Today is my day. Say this, whether any of these other people get it, that's on them. Today is my day. I receive your healing from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. And I will live in health. Say, my health was purchased for me at a high price. In Jesus' name, I am healed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. In order to keep what God gives you, you have to be born again. Jesus healed that crippled man in John 5. Then he went back and found them and said, now that you're better, stop sinning or a worse thing will come upon you. If you go back into the devil's territory after you've been set free, it's a bad move. The Bible says he, ke he holds them securely in his right hand and the evil, touches him, touches, the evil one touches them not. So the thing that exempts you from the infringement of the enemy into your life is that you're held securely in God's right hand. You take shelter underneath his wings. But if you're living outside of the covenant, you're fair game. So you must be born again. If you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, or you once did, but you fell away, and you need to shore your account with God this morning, come back to this night service tonight knowing that your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're not trying to get crumbs for the dog. You get the bread that's for the children. That's what being born again is. It's not joining Christianity. It's becoming God's very own child. If you're here and you've never done that, or you once did and you fell away, and you want to leave out those doors and have the happiest lunch you've ever had, knowing that your sins are gone, you've been redeemed. That's one prayer away, but you need to pray it now. That's you, and you say, Jonathan, that's me, and I want to do it now. I want you to put your hand up high and wave it at me, and we're going to pray in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. I see your hand. Anyone else? Keep it up and let me see it. I see your hand, sir. Very quickly, if you lifted your hand, slip out of your seat and come and join me at the altar. We're going to pray right now. Come quickly. If you have more boldness, come, come first. It'll help those that are more timid. Let's pray together. Amen. Who else? I know there were more hands. Amen. <laughs> You're great. Lift both hands to the Lord. 
Say this out loud. Heavenly Father, I repent of all my sin. I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord and my Savior. Right now, I receive forgiveness. By the blood of Jesus, I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me see your right hand. Lift the other one up to the Lord. I bless you in Jesus' name. You'll walk a different path from this hour. Blessings will chase you wherever you go as you stay on that path with God. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the family. God bless you. Give Jesus a big hand clap all over this place. Just say one more thing to you. Say the shield of faith quenches all the fiery darts of the devil. And then faith is born of the word of God. So now... You have a shield. See, now, now you think scripture thoughts. You feel something trying to attack your body. You, you should hate it. You never get delivered of anything you're not disgusted with. So the word of God gives you a holy disgust for sickness. This does not belong in my body. Camila, when she was two, had a big rash on her leg. That does not belong on my daughter's leg. It's unscriptural for that to be there. And that's what gives you the fire to properly rise up against something and break its jaw. You know, if you're shopping in Nordstrom and somebody breaks in, then you think, well, Nordstrom has a problem. I'm going to go to my car and get out of here. This isn't my domain. But if someone breaks into your home, you know you could literally do about anything you want to them. But down here. And you're within the bounds of the law. Because it's your property. They don't have a legal right in your home. And there, there should be a violent hostility that rises up with you. Uh, you know, well, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he's not here to steal that much. No. And you also wouldn't say, well, robbery is a part of this c culture now. Crime's up. It's only a matter of time. No. But people do that with sickness. Well, see, it's just a little thing. You know, every spring I get allergies. No, that's not in the Bible. Well, sickness is a part of life. No, you wouldn't say that. Just like you wouldn't say, well, robberies are a part of owning a home. They are for some people, but they won't be for me. And I'll do something about it. The Bible says, whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. Whatever you per permit on earth, I'll permit in heaven. Why did God allow that? Well, God would allow when that robber comes in him to do whatever he wants, but you have to take dominion. And today, from this day forward, any time the enemy tries to infringe, he will be met with a violent word-based resistance from your spirit. You will, you have your health, you'll keep your health to the glory of God and to the shame of the devil. Come on, if you receive that one more time, clap those hands. throw it out with the word. Amen. I'm not receiving an offering this morning because I don't feel like it. And we're coming back in, in a few hours. And listen, the enemy did take an hour of sleep from us. None of us were consulted about that clock change thing. I don't even know what the point is. But you, you, you go eat, you go get that hour of sleep back. I give you permission. Take a holy nap and set your alarm. We're going to come in here tonight at 6 o'clock and give the devil a nice boot to the teeth you watch how many captives get set free tonight tonight is going to be a great night in the presence of the lord and then uh monday through friday week two is not going to be review week two we're going to take it to another level can you say amen god bless you give jesus a big hand clap enjoy your afternoon i'll see you in a few hours in jesus name